Does skill-based matchmaking even matter? That's the question that's been on my mind since these servers for the classic Call of Duty games were revived last June, and today, we're using math and science to answer that exact question. So this is the nature of my experiments. I played 25 games of Team Deathmatch on Black Ops 2 and then 25 more on Black Ops Cold War. All the while, I kept track of my personal kill-death ratio, my teammates' kill-death ratio, and the enemy team's kill-death ratio, as well as the team's scores and my winning percentage across all 50 games. I also took note of everyone's playstyle and the overall feel of the lobby from game to game to see if there was a noticeable difference between titles. I decided on these specific games because Black Ops 2 is the most popular of Treyarch's classic Call of Duty games, and by comparing it to Cold War, we're not mixing and matching lead developers. It took about 10 hours to play all 50 games, but after two days I managed to record them all. This is what all 50 of those games looked like. I'll give you a second to watch them. How did you like it? What was your favorite part? My favorite part was that every one of the stats I set out to track changed significantly between games. The winning percentage was the stat I was the most curious about, and the difference in team success between titles was staggering. In Cold War, I won just about as many games as I lost. After 25 games, I was one game above 500 for a winning percentage of 52%, but in Black Ops 2, I won three games for every two that I lost, for a winning percentage of 64%. A difference of three games may not sound like a lot, but that winning percentage is the difference between a major league sports team being middle of the road and being first place in the entire league. That being said, this stat is the most likely to change with a larger sample size, especially considering how close some of those games ended up being. Speaking of how close games were, Cold War's games were much more competitive. On average, my team was able to reach a score of 89.4, while the enemy team only reached 84.5, meaning that each game was within 5 kills of each other on average. That's a fairly close game. Compare that to Black Ops 2 where the difference was 70 to 64. And now's a good time to mention that TDM in Black Ops 2 ends after the 75th kill, whereas Cold War ends after 100, but regardless the teams in Black Ops 2 were separated by 8 kills instead of 5. That in combination with Cold War's reduced winning percentage might make you think that skill-based matchmaking was making each game closer and more competitive, but after some further digging I discovered that wasn't the case. The definition of a blowout changes from person to person. Person. But if we define a blowout as one team losing by 15 or more kills, Black Ops 2 had 13 blowouts across 25 games, whereas Cold War had 17. If we narrow blowouts down to a team that lost by 25 or more kills, Black Ops 2 had 6 blowouts, whereas Cold War had 8. Somehow, despite making the winning percentage across multiple matches closer, the parity between teams has gotten worse in the new game. You wouldn't guess that team parity was worse when you look at each team's KD ratio. On average, my team in Black Ops 2 finished with a KD ratio of 1.09, where the enemy team finished with a ratio of 0.92. In Black Ops Cold War, those numbers jumped to 1.45 for friendlies and 1.42 for enemies. So on average, enemies are more deadly and teams are closer in skill. At first glance, this doesn't line up with what we've learned so far, and there's a good reason for that. A reason that makes the rest of the data nearly impossible to solve for. When the Modern Warfare reboot launched, Launched in 2019, Call of Duty started to change the way data was displayed to the player. Where the scoreboard used to show kills, assists, and deaths as separate stats, deaths were removed from the scoreboard entirely while kills and assists were rolled into one single elimination stat, which greatly inflated the KD ratios across the board. Truthfully, we're comparing KD ratios to ED ratios because eliminations are extremely generous. I mean, just look at this clip here. I deal 1% of the required damage to kill this player, and I am rewarded with an elimination. That elimination is worth the same amount as this elimination where I deal 100% of the damage needed for the kill. And this is the point where I need to rant about how stupid of a decision this was. Like, in what world does this make any sense for a Call of Duty game? In a team-based shooter like Overwatch or Battlefield where you need teamwork to properly play the game, something like this does make a lot of sense. But in Call of Duty, everyone is more often than not playing as a lone wolf, so it makes absolutely no sense to track statistics in this way. It's not squads of multiple players fighting each other, it's a series of one-on-one -on -one gunfights where teammates rarely communicate and work together to fight the enemy. Some people are fine not showing deaths to keep people from fixating on their performance, and there's at least some discussion to be had there, but this elimination stat is inferior to kills and assists in every possible way. Okay, 
rant over. So even though eliminations are awful, we can still use it to judge the effectiveness of team balance by seeing how often there's a massive gap between each team's ED ratio. If we define a blowout as a team's average ED ratio being half a point higher or lower than the other, Black Ops 2 has 10 games that would be considered a blowout, whereas Cold War has 12. If we bump the criteria for a blowout up to a whole point, Black Ops 2 drops down to 3 games and Cold War drops down to 6. Even with the benefit of Cold War counting assists as kills, which could potentially double the amount of kills each team receives and give a massive boost to losing players' ED ratio, the team balancing is still proving worse than the numbers. Now it's worth mentioning that those calculations were done without including my own KD and ED ratios, and that was done intentionally. Because of the lone wolf mentality I mentioned in my eliminations rant, COD players often separate themselves from their team when they talk about their performance. If the team is losing but you're at the top of the leaderboard while the rest of your team struggles, it's not your fault and the rest of your team needs to improve. This is a different mentality from something you would see in a game like Overwatch or Battlefield, where a player might consider switching heroes or classes to help improve their team's construction, or try and hold down a power position to give their team more map control in a game like Halo. But because most COD players don't really think that way, I presented the data in the way the community most often talks about it. Whether or not that's right is up to you. And that leads us to the final and arguably most important statistic when talking about skill-based matchmaking. My own performance. Across all 25 games of Cold War, my average ED ratio was a respectable 1.8. Four of those games had an ED lower than 1.0, meaning I was likely hurting my team's chance to win, and in nine of those games, my ED was higher than 2.0, meaning I was performing noticeably well among my team. In none of those games was my ED higher than 4.0. Meanwhile, in Black Ops 2, my KD skyrocketed to 2.91, but that's largely because of a single 17 KD ratio where my team dominated and I only died once. If we remove that obvious outlier, my KD drops to a more realistic but still good 2.33. But even so, there are still a couple of games that stand out as potential outliers. So if we go a step further and remove any game with a KD higher than my highest ED in Cold War, we land at 2.09. Even with all that cherry picking and responsible removal of outliers, which statisticians don't count as cherry picking but COD fans might, we cannot lower my KD enough to match Cold War's ED. And that is with the benefit of assists in Cold War counting as eliminations, thus boosting my stats. This noticeable decline is likely why there's such a hatred of skill-based matchmaking in the community. Everyone of every skill level and interest level wants to contribute and help their team win, and if you were good enough to do both consistently for years only to have a matchmaking change make both way less likely, then of course you would be upset. And when you combine that with the other undesired changes to the gameplay loop like removing red dot sites on a minimap, chunkier movement, changes to the perks and creative class system and more, it's entirely reasonable to dislike the post-reboot games. I haven't mentioned the overall vibe of the lobbies so far, but the difference between each game was like night and day. Black Ops 2 played noticeably faster than Cold War. Players aimed down sights faster, strafed faster, walked faster, and got kills faster. Or at least it felt that way. A lot of Cold War, and especially the rebooted Modern Warfare games design, is promoting predominantly defensive play styles, and I don't think that's an accident. Just as the speed of FPS titles slowed down when Doom and Quake were replaced by Halo and Call of Duty, the speed is slowing down once again as the console deathmatch shooter is being replaced in popularity by battle royales and extraction shooters, both of which reward players with defensive playstyles who focus on minimizing deaths over maximizing kills. And while I don't want to say one playstyle is better than the other, it's clearly at odds with what some fans are expecting from the traditional COD 6v6 multiplayer. And unfortunately for those fans, Treyarch, Sledgehammer, and especially Infinity Ward, are doubling down on that defensive style of gameplay. It's why enemies no longer appear on the minimap after firing unsilenced weapons in the Modern Warfare games. Infinity Ward wants players to listen for threats like they would in a battle royale instead of looking for them on the minimap. The same can be said for why they won't make Dead Silence a perk again. They want you to listen and take in your environment, which can only be done by slowing down the second to second gameplay. The reason the time to kill is so low when every attachment seems to slow down your ADS speed isn't because they're concerned about realism or your gun's weight with and without attachments, it's because they want players to anticipate enemies around every corner and play as though it's a one life mode. Again, whether or not this is a good thing comes down to personal preference. After all, it seems to work wonders for Rainbow Six, but it's clearly not how everyone in the Call of Duty community feels. So, with all that being said, 
does skill-based matchmaking matter? Well, after parsing all of the data, I can confidently say that I have no idea. Let me explain. Based on the comparisons between Black Ops 2 and Cold War, the newer matchmaking system seems to be inferior to the older one. Despite a multi-game sample average showing that matches are much closer and more competitive, they're ending in blowouts far more often than before. And with how wide the margins of victory actually are, it takes control of the game's outcome out of an individual player's hands. That being said, so much about Call of Duty changed alongside the matchmaking overhaul that it's impossible to tell scientifically what's causing the most pressing issues. We don't know how skill-based matchmaking would look in a more traditional Call of Duty game, and in my opinion, the worst parts of modern Call of Duty multiplayers are not caused by the matchmaking. Let's face it, even if Activision threw their fancy new matchmaking system in the trash, the games would still be incomplete at launch, the store would still be heavily emphasized, ADS times and movement would still be very slow, Infinity Ward still wouldn't revert the minimap changes and reintroduce Dead Silence as a perk, prestiging would still be seasonal, and Vanguard would still be Vanguard. And that's the moral of the story. Nothing can make Vanguard a good game. So does skill-based matchmaking even matter? I don't know. Look at them! Look at what they're doing! This is how they're playing the game. <laughs> 